Hey everyone, in this stream, we'll look at rendering, uh, specifically how React handles rendering. In the last stream, we looked at state and went over this page. So check out the last stream if you haven't, but we go over some of the examples that the um, React team has provided in their documentation. Um, just to kind of recap, we're using these beta documentations that are still in beta and hasn't been published um and replace kind of the original documentation but that's the page i'm referencing and we're going to go over render and commit part in this stream and in the last stream we also looked at something called rules of hooks and we looked at why you shouldn't call hooks inside loops conditions and nested functions so um i said in the last stream that this can this probably ties up to rendering so we'll look at it um, in this stream, probably somewhere in the middle. All right, let's get started. So render and commit. Before your components are displayed on the screen, they must be rendered by React. That makes sense. Um, understanding the steps in this process will help you think about how your, how your code executes and explain its behavior. So this is something I think that will that becomes very important if you're trying to optimize for performance. So if you understand when will React re-render your component, you could write code that is optimized uh, for minimum re-rendering cycles, right? So every time there's a rendering that happens, you know, some of the CPU cycles of the client is, are being used and it can create latency issues and kind of um, not make the user experience as good as possible, right? So this is an important topic if you're trying to do optimizations of your performance and i think in general everyone should know about rendering and how react handles rendering so in this page we'll learn about what rendering means in react when and why react renders a component the steps involved in displaying a component on the screen and why rendering does not always produce a dom update why rendering does not always produce a dom update that's interesting. Sometimes I think React would re-render, but maybe the tree would be the same, so they don't even update the DOM. So React has this concept of something called the virtual DOM, uh, which they'll probably get into in this guide. But I think that's what they're talking about, that they don't even update the DOM if the virtual DOM and the DOM are the same. All right, let's get into it. So imagine that your components are cooks in the kitchen, assembling tasty dishes from ingredients. In this scenario, React is the waiter who puts in requests from customers and brings them their orders. So our components are cooks in the kitchen. So we can see our button and cards are kind of cooks in the kitchen. And sorry, let me just mute my phone. Um, they're assembling tasty dishes from ingredients. So they have some sort of ingredients, which they don't mention here. Um, which is probably something about like the business logic in your component, right? Like they're trying to do something, which are the ingredients. And in this scenario, React is the waiter who puts in requests from customers and bring them their orders. So a customer is maybe the user or the browser where, you know, they're coming in with an order and then based on what's happening here, React kind of decides what to give back to the user. So um, the three steps are triggering a render, so delivering the guest order to the kitchen. Um, so kind of here, so they're giving us an order, they're rendering it, which is preparing, and then committing to the DOM, placing the order on the table. That's an interesting analogy. Um, so I think when an event happens that can trigger a re-render, that's what this is. So like when you click a button, um, that triggers a re-render. And then what's actually happening to re-render that? React kind of handles that complexity. And then once that is finished, it would actually serve it back um, to the user or the customer that this is the newly this is the newly rendered page that you're seeing. So let's talk about step one. There are two reasons. It's the component's initial render, so the first time the component is being rendered, or the state has been updated. So if you haven't looked at the last stream, uh, please do so because this 
um, stream is going to build up on the knowledge of last stream. So the initial render is when your app starts, you need to trigger the initial render. Uh, frameworks and sandboxes sometimes hide this code, but it's done by calling create root with the target DOM node and then calling its render method with your component. So the way React re like initially renders your application is by creating a root element uh, by giving it an ID of root and then calling the render, which is going to be your kind of your um, home component or your app component. So it renders kind of the first component that needs to render the um, all of the other components in your application. All right, so try commenting out the root render and see the component disappear. So essentially this image is a React component, but this is a plain JavaScript file. Um, and here essentially we're importing uh, some React function and then doing something on it. So they're saying if we comment out our root.render, we see the component disappear, which makes sense. So this is the initial render. So the first time React renders your component. Now we're, we're going to talk about re-rendering. So once the component has been initially rendered, you can trigger further renders by updating its state with the set function, um, like set state function. I think this is a typo by them. But yeah, the set state function can be used to trigger a re-render. So updating the component state automatically queues a render. So I think this is an important concept. The React, I think, internally maintains a queue for, and there's a concept called batch updates. Um, I've heard of them, but I don't fully understand them. So maybe they cover this as part of um, this documentation, but they're maintaining a queue. So it doesn't instantly cause a re-render. React is kind of smart enough to figure out when is the best time to re-render the component. So you can imagine these as restaurant, restaurant guests ordering tea, dessert, and all sorts of things after putting in their first order, depending on the state of their thirst of or hunger. I really like this example. So initially, the guest probably asked for something, and then um, that was the initial render. So like, they come into the restaurant, they're like, hey, can I have some water or some appetizers? That's their first render. Um, and then anytime after that, if they're ordering tea, dessert, or even water, uh, that's essentially kind of a re-render. All right, so that makes sense. Um, and now step two is it React renders your component. So this is the triggering phase. So step one trigger. Now we're going to go over render. So after you trigger a render, React calls your components to figure out what to display on the screen. Rendering is React calling your components. I'm not sure what they mean calling components by calling components, because in computer science, calling is essentially kind of like, you know, when I think of calling, I think of function calls, but it might be different here. So on initial render, React will call the root component. For subsequent renders, React will call the function component whose state update triggered the render. OK, so because in React, components are functions now, I think calling is the same thing. So React will call the function component whose state update triggered the render. OK, let's, let's kind of continue. Maybe this will make more sense. This process is recursive. If the updated component returns some other component, React will render that component next. And if that component also returns something, it will render that component next and so on. The process will continue until there are no more nested components and React knows exactly what should be displayed on the screen. All right, so React will call these components several times. Let's take a look at what's going on here. So in our index, um, we just call create root and we render gallery, right? But in our gallery, we're rendering three images. And inside our image, we're rendering um, these three images side by side. So nothing fancy going on here. So here it says, during the initial render, React will create the DOM nodes for section H1 and image. 
So these are just DOM nodes, right? Section H1 and, Im uh, and image, which is here. And during a re-render, React will recalculate which of their properties, if any, have changed in the previous render. <clears throat> it won't do anything with that information until the next step, the commit phase. So it looks like in the step two, React is just calculating what has changed rather than um, you know, kind of what we looked at. It's This is just step two. Step three is actually committing it back to the DOM. But in step two, React is just figuring out what exactly has changed. And this process is recursive. So if you have like a complicated component hierarchy where you have nested components and let's say a state update happens at the parent component. So React would, would essentially re-render all of its child components, even though their state hasn't changed. Um, I'm not sure if there's some optimization going on under the hood, but that's what it looks like. Because if the updated component returns some other component, React will render that component next, right? So it looks like if our parent component returns some children components, like gallery is returning three children components, React would still render, like React when it tries to render gallery, it would render three images again, even though these are kind of pure components, they don't have any state, so they should never change. All right, let's continue to the commit phase. Um, okay, let's read this pitfall real quick. So rendering must always be a pure calculation. Um, there is a really good article on keeping components pure, um, something that we could kind of look into in another stream. But pure essentially means, yeah, they kind of mention it here, same input, same output. Given the same input, a component should always return the same output, which is JSX. When someone orders a salad with tomatoes, they should not receive a salad with onions. That makes sense. It minds its own business. It should not change any objects or variable that existed before rendering. One order should not change anyone else's order. Otherwise, you can encounter confusing bugs and an unpredictable behavior as your code base grows in complexity. When developing in strict mode, React calls each component function twice, which can help surface mistakes caused by impure functions. So there's this concept of strict mode in React, which is only enabled, if I'm not wrong, on develop. And the way it works is it tries to re-render everything twice so that you can catch bugs locally before it reaches the production. And the reason it does that is it surfaces bugs that could have been caused because a component wasn't pure. It was manipulating some state outside of its scope and not handling it properly properly right like it was um it was outputting different things given the same input which confuses react right so that's why they're saying same input same output i think this is probably one of my favorite articles uh keeping components pure so when we go over that um we can kind of look at pros and cons of doing that and not doing that. All right, deep dive. Um, so optimizing performance. The default behavior of rendering all components nested within the updated component is not optimal for performance if the updated component is very high in the tree. This is kind of what I was talking about, that if you have a kind of your root component being re-rendered, React recursively calling all of the children which could be hundreds of thousands of components again seems suboptimal so they're saying if you run into a performance issue there are several opt-in ways to solve it described in the performance section but they're saying don't optimize prematurely so it looks like they're providing you a way to optimize that uh, by kind of using some opt-in method so like they don't they don't have it enabled by default um they probably had good reasons um i'm assuming one of the reasons would have been that it was it would have made some debugging very difficult because they're optimizing prematurely so you don't really understand why something is not working the way it should work and that's probably where 
they decided that it's better to have it as an opt-in feature rather than um, enabling it by default. All right, so this is again something we can cover in some other stream. So lastly, we're on step three, which is React committing the changes that it calculated in the previous step, which is when it was calling the render method um, again and again recursively. So now it's gonna commit it to the DOM. So after rendering or calling your components, React will modify the DOM. For the initial render, React will use the append child DOM API to put all the DOM nodes it has created on the screen. For re-renders, React will apply the minimum minimal necessary operations calculated while rendering to make the DOM match the latest rendering output. So in case any of you don't know what DOM is, DOM is essentially, um, it's called document object model. And it's the way you structure the web page, a web page in kind of a trees and nodes uh, data structure. So you start with the document, you know, you've all of you have seen, you know, HTML tags, head tags. So it's just um, kind of a way to structure your web page and expose some APIs on it that you can use. So when they're talking about the append child API, they're talking about you can you can essentially call this uh, function or method on a node, and you can add childs to it. So let's say just a quick recap. Um, this might not be the best example, but if I were to add, oh, right here. So the section is a node which has four children. So React initially would call the append child to add this as a child and this and this and this, right? So it calls the append child four times and that's what they're talking about in the initial render. And let me close that. For re-renders, React will apply the minimum necessary operations to make the DOM match the latest rendering output. So there are other APIs that it uses, not just a pen child, to kind of update each node to match what, the, what React calculated in step two, right? So React only changes the DOM nodes if there is a difference between renders. So for example, here's a component that renders with different props passed from its parent every second. Notice how you can add some text into input, updating its value, but the text doesn't disappear when the component re-renders. All right, let's see what's going on here. So this component clock is taking in a prop of time, and this time is being updated every one second, and it has an H1 and an input. So even if I enter something, let's say hello world, even though the time is changing, my hello world is not being reset to empty. And I'm trying to understand why that happens. So for example, here's a component that re-renders with different props passed from its parent every second. So time is actually different every second. But you, we, can, we can add some text in the input updating its value, but the text doesn't disappear when the component re-renders. So a component is being re-rendered, which is why we're seeing a different time, but the input field kind of maintains its state. And the reason for that is this works before, because during this last step, React only updates the content of H1 with the new time. It sees that the input appears in JSX in the same place as last time. So React doesn't touch the input or its value. Um, I see what they're saying. But I think this is kind of a confusing example, at least for me. So I guess it looks like when the time is being updated, React realizes that the render is caused by the change in time. So they look at this line and then see, they see that the time is updated so let's update this but since input has nothing to do with time it maintains its state uh, so react doesn't even touch it so it sees that the input appears in jsx in the same place as last time so nothing has changed about the input so react doesn't touch the input or its value 
Yeah, I don't think this is the best example, but I think it makes some sense to me. All right, let's go over epilog. Just a second, I'm just gonna drink some water. All right, epilog, browser paint. So after rendering is done and React updates to DOM, the browser will repaint the screen. Although this process is known as browser rendering, we'll refer to as painting to avoid confusion in the rest of these dogs. So after step three, when React has kind of used the DOM API to uh, commit to the DOM, to let the DOM know that, hey, I wanna update my components um, and whatever you're showing on the browser to this specific um, state, the browser has to do that, right? The browser has to paint or repaint the page that you're seeing to a different value. So they're calling it painting, but browser rendering is a is a common word for it. I like their I like their graphic. It's like the browser is literally just a painter for this. Um, so any screen update in React app happens on three steps. Trigger, when state changes um, or the initial render, then actual render step where React actually figures out what has changed. And then the third step when it actually commits to the DOM that you know this is the final state I wanna be in. So like make the changes on the DOM. And then the browser would, after the commit phase, after the commit sta uh, stage, it would cause a repaint. And strict mode, can be used to make sure that your components are pure. And it says React does not touch the DOM if the rendering result is the same as last time. So when React, I believe in the render step, realizes that the DOM matches what they have calculated, they don't even call the API, which makes sense. You know, Why would you cause an update which has no change, right? So it's an optimization that they've done. Um, so this stream has been 22 minutes already. So I think we can start to touch on rules of hooks and look at um, what really goes on under the belt um, when you call um, use effect or like you call hooks inside loops, conditionals or nested functions. Let's see how long this is before we kind of do that. All right, it's not too long. So I think we can cover it. All right, so um, hooks are a new addition in React 16.8. They let you use state and other React features without writing a class. So this is kind of the new way to write React using functional components and hooks. So this is what they're talking about here. They're saying hooks are JavaScript functions, but you need to follow two rules when using them. We provide a linter plugin to enforce these rules automatically. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, I didn't know they provided that. In the project that I'm working on, we have created some um, some of our own hooks as well. So we should probably look into enabling this um, to catch any bugs that might be um, in the code base already. So I'm just going to kind of write a note in my workplace note-taking app. OK, there we go. All right. So only call hooks at the top level. So don't call hooks inside loops, conditions, or nested functions. Instead, always use hooks at the top level of your React function because any early returns before any early returns. Okay. By following this rule, you ensure that the hooks are called in the same order each time a component renders. So if they were inside loops or conditions, um, they, the, the code could take a different branch of execution, which would call the hooks differently every time. And it looks like that's what confuses React. So that's what allows React to pres preserve the state of hooks between multiple use state and use effect calls. If you're curious, uh, we'll explain this in depth below. So they're saying don't call hooks from regular JavaScript functions. Instead, you can call hooks from React function components, call hooks from custom hooks, uh, this is kind of one of the things that we're using in our project. By following this rule, you ensure that all stateful logic in a component is clearly visible from its source code. So when you have it at the top of your functions, 
um, any reader can just essentially see what what kind of state this component actually has, which improves readability. We're now going to go into ESLint plugin, but let's look at explanation. Um, yeah, so we kind of looked earlier that we can use multiple state or effect hooks in a single component. So here they have a function form and they're using the use state hook to store the initial value of Mary inside the name, right? And let's let's skip this for a second, and then they have another state. So now they are using something called use effect. And the way I understand use effect is it's it's a way for you to execute a function every time React re-renders. So essentially what this is doing is if React is re-rendering, which is the step two that we looked at in our render and commit, this function would be called, which is essentially storing the form data inside local storage. Local storage is a browser API, so you can store it inside the local storage um, by storing key value pairs of form data with the name. And then similarly here, um, oh, this is kind of a different hook. So it says update title. Oh, I see. So every time the state is updated, so every time there's a re-render, we update the document's title to name and surname. So now the question is, so how does React know which state corresponds to which use state call? So there's two use states here. How does React know which state corresponds to which use state? Okay. The answer is that React relies on the order in which hooks are called. Our example works because order of hook, the order of the hook calls is the same on every render. So in the first render, this is kind of what we're doing, right? And in the second render, this is exactly what we're doing as well. Like the orders are the same. Um, so we can see that in the first render, they're initi we're initializing the name to be Mary, we're adding an effect, we're initializing the surname, and then we're adding an effect. In the second render, for, um, I see, so because it's a second render, U state's argument is ignored because it's a default value for the first render. So it reads the name state variable, which is this one on any subsequent renders. And it replaces the effect for persisting the form um, not sure what they mean by re replace. Probably checking if this function does something different this time. Then it reads the surname, similarly what happens in step one, and then replaces the effect for updating the title. So now they're saying as long as the order of the hook calls is the same between renders, React can associate some local state with each of them. But what happens if you put a hook call, for example, the persist form effect inside a condition? All right, let's see. So they're saying now that if we use some sort of condition by saying if the name is empty, not empty, only then persist the form, which is something that is reasonable, right? Like I can see that this is some sort of requirement where you only want to save something if the user has entered something, right? And the condition is true on the first render, so we run this hook, because initially the name is set to Mary, right? So the condition is true, and we would call this use effect. However, on the next render, the user might clear this form, making the condition false. Now that we skip this hook during rendering, the order of the hook calls become different. So you can see that we're skipping this hook because this is not called because this is inside a conditional if the user um, removes the name completely. So now this is executed as the second step. And it looks like there's just failures. Um, React just cannot associate the fact that React relies on the ordering of these hook calls. And because they have been skipped, 
I think it just gets messed up. It's not even able to kind of process these hook calls. So here they say React wouldn't know what to return for the second use state hook call. React expected that the second hook call in this component corresponds to persist form effect, just like during the previous render, but it doesn't anymore. From that point, every next hook call after the one we skipped would also shift by one, leading to bugs. Interesting. So they are saying now that this is why hooks must be called on the top level of our components. If we want to run an effect conditionally, we can put that condition inside our hook. I see. So they're saying if you want to do that, if that's a requirement, put the conditional inside the hook, but don't call the hook conditionally. That's yeah. That's a that's a very dif difficult um, thing to catch during PR reviews. I feel like if someone is um, writing code that breaks this rule. I feel like it can easily be um, ignored and passed through the code review. But here they say that you don't have to worry about this if you use the linter. So you let the linter take care of these bugs. But now at least we know why hooks work this way and which issues the rule is preventing. So just to kind of recap, React relies on the order in which hooks are called. So the hooks should be called the same in the same order every single time. And when you kind of use call a hook inside a conditional, then React gets confused. So I'm actually curious what happens. Like I might try to do a proof of concept where I try to kind of purposely um, create this bug to actually see what happens. Right, like what does it mean for React to fail here? Uh, but that's kind of out of scope for this stream. Um, maybe something I create like a specific video on. So I think that's all for the stream. Um, we kind of looked at specifically rendering, so render and commit, and we looked at rules of hooks. And we looked at why should we not call hooks inside loops, conditions, or nested functions, because React relies on the fact that hooks are called in the same order. And we also looked at the three different steps of rendering. So it's triggering a render, rendering the actual component, and then committing to the DOM. And then in the DOM, even after we commit it, there's another step called browser paint, where the browser actually paints whatever was committed to the DOM. All right, let's stop there. Um, I'll probably have another stream um, maybe tomorrow about some other topics in this documentation.